Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. At Bright Vibe, we believe everyone deserves to be happy. But in today's world, everywhere you turn, there is division and negativity. At Bright Vibe, we have created a global movement to bring 8 million people together who are inspired to live bright, live bold, and share bright vibes. Alone, it can be hard to change, but together we can change the world. Welcome to the Bright Vibe Podcast. Well, you know, for, for whatever reason, I was into biohacking long before biohacking was a word. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was, you know, from the time I was a little kid, I was kind of obsessed with experimenting with my physiology and figuring out whatever ways I could to make my body and my brain function better. And that's kind of been kind of my life's obsession since I was like 12 or 13 years old. And um, I've done, you know, as a teenager, I did every extreme wacky diet imaginable. I had much less uh, scientific literacy back then. So it was much easier to fool me and, um, you know, into pseudoscientific gimmicks of all sorts. So I ended up doing all of them, yeah. <laughs> all the pseudoscientific gimmicks and extreme diets and whatever wacky stuff it, it was being promoted at the time. And um, I was just, yeah, I've, I've always been kind of into that experimentation with my physiology. Um, and how can I make my body, my mind, my brain, my, my spirit function better? Just, you know, kind of obsessed with that human optimization spirit. And um, you know, from a young age, I was into bodybuilding. My older brother was a personal trainer and an aspiring bodybuilder, and um, and his mentors were professional bodybuilders. And so I was kind of in that world, wanting to be like Big Brother and being mentored by by him and and his mentors. Um, and then in my mid twenties, things shifted for me pretty dramatically because uh, I got mononucleosis from Epstein Barr virus, oh, wow. and I was debilitated by that um pretty darn good for close to a year wow um you know the the acute phase of the actual sort of infectious illness was about six weeks and uh and then after that i was left with with debilitating chronic fatigue and i really watched my life kind of fall apart um as I didn't have the energy to, to give to these different aspects of my life. So, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time and that relationship kind of fell apart. I had friendships, I had, I was in school studying, I had a, um, a job, it was a hard physical manual labor job and I really couldn't do any of it well. And I, this, this was a big frame shift for me because uh, I realized how important this thing called energy was, this thing that I had taken for granted all of my life up until then as a healthy, fit, athletic guy. Um, And at that point, I started to see conventional doctors. I really, the short version is I realized they they didn't really have anything to offer people with chronic fatigue. And I started to see um, alternative medicine practitioners, functional medicine practitioners, natural health people. And they were really obsessed with this whole adrenal fatigue narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, I went and got my adrenals tested, my cortisol levels tested. It was perfectly normal. And yet all these people were obsessed with diagnosing me with adrenal fatigue. And uh, I was interested to kind of explore that more deeply. And I ended up digging into the literature and ultimately discovering that the science really doesn't support the notion of adrenal fatigue as really as a thing entirely. Um, and certainly not, it doesn't support it as the main cause of chronic fatigue. And as I made that discovery, I realized that really nobody within conventional medicine or alternative medicine and, and natural health had figured out what the heck is going on with human energy levels. What, what, what are the real causes of chronic fatigue and what are the real things that regulate human energy levels and i both saw this as an opportunity to um basically i saw it as an opportunity and i was naturally i became very interested in it for my own personal Mm -hmm. selfish reasons for my own energy levels um and i you know, because I had such a strong background in health science up until then, I well, well, maybe I can be the, the, the one who sort of builds out the real scientific framework of 
what regulates human energy levels? How do we overcome chronic fatigue? How do we optimize our energy levels for superhuman energy? And, uh, and that's really been my obsession for the last decade or so. Thank you for listening to the Bright Vibe podcast today. We've got a special event coming up here shortly, July 12th through the 16th, called the Global Happiness Summit. And we're bringing resources from around the country together to talk about happiness and what that means and how to have more of that in our lives. Go to brightvibe.com, B-R-I-T-E, vibe, B-I-B-E.com for more information about the Global Happiness Summit. And we look forward to seeing you July 12th through the 16th. That's interesting. How do you know, how did, did you know that what conventional medicine was telling you and even kind of maybe even the, the holistic side, how did you know what they were telling you was wrong? Was it just because it wasn't working for you with the combination of the fact that you had this interest and kind of somewhat background in it? I mean, at what point did you know, God, there's, they're just wrong. They don't get it. I mean, how did you, because I would be sitting there, I would find myself going, well, who am I to say? You know, mm-hmm. how, how did, at what point did you go, okay, there's something here, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I alluded to part of that, but I'll go in, in greater depth. So with conventional medicine, I didn't talk about this. Um, there was a study, not a study, but a compilation of the research that was published in the Journal of the American Family Physicians. It's called uh, Fatigue and Overview. And it's basically a, a compilation of sort of what they're within conventional medicine they're they're basically saying this is what we know about chronic fatigue and here are the evidence-based guidelines evidence-based quote unquote um, for how physicians should treat their patients with chronic fatigue and this paper said a few really interesting things Um, first of all it said there's four treatments that we have for chronic fatigue, uh, according to the evidence, quote unquote. And the four treatments that they have are antidepressants, a recommendation to go for a walk for half an hour a day, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and stimulants as needed. So that's, I mean, literally, that's what they list in this, in this paper, this evidence-based guidelines for, for treating fatigue. Um, you may notice nutrition isn't even mentioned. Yeah, I was going to say that's a big <laughs> or hydration. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, so it's to the it's to the point where someone could show up to a doctor's office with you know eating nothing but potato chips and pizza and McDonald's and donuts, and the doctor wouldn't even it wouldn't even be within their paradigm to ask that patient what their diet is, right. let alone to consider that as a cause of their fatigue. Wow. Um, so, you know, as someone who had already been studying nu- nutrition for over a decade at that point, that was a huge red flag to me. Right. Um, another aspect was they talked in this study about testing. And they basically said if, unless you suspect some specific rare illness, like let's say tuberculosis or something like that, then, then you run a tuberculosis test. But otherwise, generally speaking, you're going to run a standard blood panel. And I think most people think you know, modern science, modern blood testing. And, you know, I, if I have fatigue, I'm going to go to my doctor. They're going to run a blood test. They're going to figure out what's causing my fatigue, right? With, with all the sophistication of, and, and cutting edge tools of modern science and medicine. And they literally say in this paper, only in 5% of cases of p- patients with chronic fatigue, do they find anything on that blood test that could explain or be a contributing factor to that chronic fatigue. Wow. Holy so in other words, 5% of the time, they might find something like anemia or hypothyroidism mm. or di- diabetes or something like that. But in 95 out of 100 patients with chronic fatigue who go to their doctor, they are told nothing about what is causing their fatigue. And they're ultimately just given those four things that I, that I told you before. So antidepressants, walk for half an hour a day, cognitive behavioral therapy, and take stimulants as needed. To me, it was, you know, with a, a strong background in nutrition and fitness, it was very obvious that these people have no idea what they're doing. Um, and then I, I went into the whole alternative medicine, functional medicine space, natural health. And I, again, I was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue. Yeah. 
And, uh, and then my, they actually tested me and my adrenals were right. fine and my cortisol levels were normal. Um, so I ended up actually becoming kind of obsessed with this whole adrenal fatigue thing. Why, why are thousands of articles online about this topic um, and all kinds of books written and a million people who have created videos on it? Yet if you ask a conventional doctor, an endocrinologist, about adrenal fatigue, they laugh at it and say it's pseudoscience and the science absolutely does not support it. I was intrigued by this and I ended up spending actually a full year of my life, believe it or not, uh, digging into the research specifically on that topic. There's, I could talk to you about sort of two hours about uh, that, that year of my life and everything <laughs> that I found, but the very short version of it is uh, I ultimately discovered that the research really does not support the notion that people with chronic fatigue of various kinds, whether we're talking about stress-related exhaustion disorder, whether we're talking about clinical burnout, burnout syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, or any other label of different types of fatigue syndromes, there are dozens and dozens of studies where they've looked at those patients with, uh, with those various fatigue syndromes, and they've measured their cortisol levels, they've measured their HPA axis function, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis function, and they've compared those levels to um, normal healthy people without fatigue. And the prediction based on the adrenal fatigue hypothesis is, is very simple. It's extremely straightforward to prove this. If, if it's true that this is the major cause or one of the major causes of, uh, of chronic fatigue, then of course what we would expect to find in all of those dozens of studies is that in general the people who have chronic fatigue tend to have low cortisol levels right um, and for those that don't know if you're not familiar with the adrenal fatigue hypothesis basically it's the idea that that um, we have this hormone cortisol produced by our adrenal glands it's important in our response to stress but with chronic stress it tends to wear out or exhaust the adrenal glands or cause adrenal burnout and then you have low cortisol levels and, uh, and that is a major cause of chronic fatigue. Okay, that's a little bit uh, oversimplification but that's the mm -hmm. gist of it. Um, so the, the studies were very clear that virtually all of them, well, I'll give you the specific breakdown. There was 59 individual studies. There's another 20 systematic reviews or compilations of research in, for specific fatigue syndromes, but let's say 59 individual studies, mostly like the ones I just described. Um, compare the cortisol levels of fatigue people versus normal healthy people. And um, what those studies found was 15 of 59 f gave uh, evidence for slightly lower cortisol levels in the fatigue group. Slightly lower. Okay, still very much within normal limits, slightly lower. Another 11 of those studies found the opposite finding, slightly higher cortisol levels in the people <laughs> with fatigue. And the remainder, the majority of those studies, whatever it is, 33 or 34 of, uh, of those studies, um, found no discernible difference whatsoever in cortisol levels between those with fatigue and normal healthy people without fatigue. And it's, this, is, this is very simple um, from a scientific perspective. If that's the body of evidence, it's very clearly telling you that's not the cause of the, these right. people's fatigue. <laughs> if, if, you know, if you handed, let's say you went to a practitioner who believes in adrenal fatigue and you gave them 100 patients' cortisol results and you said, tell me which of these patients have chronic fatigue and which do not, they would have basically the same chance of getting those right for each individual patient as flipping a coin. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you cannot tell a person's energy levels, whether they're fatigued or not, based on their cortisol levels. Uh, and it's, it does not reliably correlate to whether someone has or does not have chronic fatigue. So, um, yeah, that, anyway, that's the, sorry if I went on too long there, but it's, <laughs> no, a, it's I mean, a big it, story. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a, well, yeah, so now my next question is that's like, right. okay, so you, you spend a year doing this, you find like, okay, now you're sitting there, now what? Regular docs ain't mm -hmm. cutting it, These natural docs ain't cutting it, in fact, they're wrong, I've just proven myself that this isn't what it is, now where do you go? 
mean, how do how what's the next step? Because I mean, we're talking about the genesis of the energy blueprint si- system, obviously. So you get to this end of this year. So what did you do? Yeah, um, I was very confused. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know what the hell is causing uh, (laughs) uh, regulating human energy levels at that point. Um, And and that really sparked my curiosity. So I I explored and I looked at lots of different potential avenues. I explored hormones very deeply, Mm -hmm. neurotransmitters very deeply, um, you know, inflammation and immune dysregulation and gut health and brain health. And the truth is there's lots and lots of different mechanisms that um, indirectly or directly relate to human energy levels, Um, dozens of things. So for example, um, we could talk about testosterone. Testosterone has an impact on energy levels. Thyroid hormone has an impact on our cellular energy production and metabolism. Um, Cortisol, melatonin, growth hormone, neurotransmitters like uh, dopamine and serotonin and GABA and orexin. Um, There's, we could look at gut health and okay, oh, you know, if you've got gut permeability, now you've got undigested food particles Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and LPS, lipopolysaccharide or bacterial endotoxin leaking into your bloodstream causing chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is something at that time i just sort of vaguely understood that chronic inflammation is something that would harm energy levels but i didn't understand the mechanisms um and and then um you know i started to look at circadian rhythm and sleep that was a huge one for me i started to realize that whoa this whole thing of our biological clock inside of our brain and we have all these peripheral clocks in our tissues um, you know, clocks, clock genes in our, uh, in our liver and in our intestines and in our skin and in our eyes, our muscles and our bones. And, and um, I started to go really deep on circadian rhythm and understanding all the different, what they call, I don't know why they use a German word, but they use the word Zeitgeber, which is basically environmental inputs um, for what controls these biological rhythms. And I started to look at, oh, there's light and, um, there's many different aspects of how light uh, relate to our circadian rhythm. And, uh, and then there's movement and, oh, temperature actually is a big zeitgeber for the circadian rhythms. And, uh, and food, nutrition actually turns out to have a huge impact, particularly on all the peripheral clocks in our body. And, um, and most people living in the modern world have extreme dysregulation of all of these circadian clocks in their body, the central one and the peripheral clocks. And what does this result in? Oh, it results in different kinds of metabolic dysfunction. It results in um, higher levels of insulin resistance. So you lose the ability to get fuel into cells. Now you've got chronic oxidative stress and hyperglycemia, and maybe those things are contributing to energy problems. Oh, it's, it's decreasing growth hormone, the, this hormone involved in uh, healing and, and tissue cellular regeneration. Um, it's decreasing, it's, it, it's dysregulating cortisol levels, it's impairing uh, testosterone and thyroid levels, it's um, messing up different hormones, uh, sorry, different neurotransmitters in the brain, it's impacting on dopamine and serotonin um, and GABA and things that affect our mood and our motivation and ability to feel joy and ability to relax and go to sleep. Um, orexin, which is this neuropeptide neurotransmitter that is involved in wakefulness and energy levels. Um, it's affecting our ability to sleep deeply. And of course, if you don't sleep deeply, you, your energy is going to be impaired. And circ- I started to realize circadian rhythm is really, I, I realized that sleep and energy are two sides of the same coin connected by this circadian rhythm. And you have to optimize that circadian rhythm if you wanna optimize both your sleep and your energy levels. Um, and I started to realize all these different mechanisms. Oh, it turns out if you, if you have uh, too much light going into your eyes at, at night, you're suppressing melatonin, which is this incredibly important hormone that it turns out is not just a sleep hormone, but is actually um, the most potent mitochondrial antioxidant. Mitochondria are our cellular energy generators. It turns out, and I'll talk much more about that, um, it turns out that 
It impacts glymphatic drainage, the clearance of toxins out of our brain and causes chronic inflammation, right? All these different mechanisms that um, clearly had either direct or indirect links to energy levels through many different pathways that I, that I just described. And really, I didn't even get into all of them. But so I started to realize circadian rhythm and sleep is this huge piece of the puzzle. Nutrition is, of course, a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, and if people are putting in garbage foods into their body, uh, they're going to have garbage cellular energy production, you know, and, and that is the subject. <laughs> I'll, I'm, t I'm touching on that in 20 seconds, but that's the subject of my 350 page new book that's about to come out, Eat for Energy. Um, so I started to realize those kinds of things. I started to realize also that um, there were studies where they looked at mitochondrial capacity. Okay, again, mitochondria are our cellular energy generators. And uh, they started, they looked at mitochondrial capacity in young adults and older adults um, by taking a huge hollow needle and jabbing it into a person's thigh and taking a big chunk of muscle out and literally looking at it under a microscope and counting the number of mitochondria uh, in, in the cells and comparing a 20-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 70-year-old. And what they found is um, that on average, mitochondrial capacity, the, the total ba simplified, basically the number of mitochondria you have in each cell, is reduced by about 10% per decade of life. So between the ages of 20 to 70, most people lose about 75% of their mitochondrial capacity. Mm. And I started to realize, oh, wow, maybe that's a big part of the story. And then I, then I found a study uh, with help with 70-year-olds um, that were athletes, lifelong athletes and exercisers. And that study showed that the 70-year-olds didn't lose 75% of their mitochondrial capacity. They actually had the same mitochondrial capacity as a young adult. And so I started to realize, well, why, why are our cellular energy generators declining in most people? And that led to a, a big focus of mine, which is hormetic stress, challenging, stimulating our mitochondria with certain kinds of stressors. And if we don't have that integrated into our life, um, we our mitochondria atrophy, just the same way that if you break a bone and you have a cast on for six or eight weeks and you get that cast off um, and you look down at your arm or your leg, it's half the size of the other one mm -hmm. because your body basically said, hey, if you don't need that muscle tissue, if it's not needed for survival, we're going to get rid of it. Um, and that I realized that's the same thing that's happening at, inside of our cells at, with our mitochondria. If you're not challenging and stimulating and using your mitochondria, your body basically gets rid of them. They atrophy, they shrink, they die off. Um, so is that part of, you know, if, if you're losing your cellular energy generators, if you go from a Ferrari engine in your cells to a moped engine, do you think that might be part of the, the, this energy story? Well, yeah. So I, I dug into that topic in great depth and I started to piece together a lot of these things. And I know I've been talking for a while, but I'll mention one last piece. Um, then I stumbled up upon the work of um, someone who I consider one of the most brilliant scientists of the last century. And that's Dr. Robert Navio, who runs a lab for mitochondrial medicine um, at the University of California, San Diego. And he came out with a paper called the cell danger response. And this completely blew my mind and blew the minds of a lot of people who are science geeks like me. Um, and basically what he, what he uncovered through his many years of research that led to this is that mitochondria are not just these sort of mindless energy generators like we're all taught to think in high school biology and college biology courses where they just sort of take in carbs and fats and pump out cellular energy in the form of ATP. It turns out they actually have another role and, and entirely beyond just cell, cellular energy production and that is in cellular defense. Mitochondria, it turns out, are these exquisitely sensitive environmental sensors, and they are constantly taking samples of their environment, um, of what's going on in the cell and around the cell, and basically asking the question, are we under attack? And this is the big revelation. Um, 
to the extent that mitochondria detect the presence of some kind of threat or a danger, and they have the ability to detect basically every type of danger from poor nutrition to psychological stress to environmental toxins to a a a circadian rhythm and sleep disruption to any other type of stress you can imagine. You can talk details about that if you want. Um, and in response to that, to the extent they're sensing the presence of some kind of danger or threat, they are turning off energy production, turning down the dial on energy production and shifting resources towards cellular defense. Mm. And um, in the words of Dr. Robert Navio, mitochondria are, you know, we're kind of taught to think about them again as these sort of mindless energy generators. They're just one of many different cellular organelles. But in his words, they are the central hub of the wheel of metabolism. And in this paradigm, we start to learn, and, and there's been many lines of evidence supporting this in the last decade, that mitochondria are actually sort of the most upstream thing that is actually controlling and regulating human energy levels. There's many different mechanisms in the body that um, relate in some way to energy production, tons of different hormones and neurotransmitters and all kinds of biochemical pathways. But the thing that's really controlling and regulating human energy levels is fundamentally your mitochondria and that whether they're in energy mode or defense mode, which is a function of to what degree is your body under attack by stressors, number one. And the second thing is what I was talking about with hormesis, to what extent do you have cells filled with lots of mitochondria that are big, strong, and robust, or to what extent have you lost your mitochondrial capacity and your mitochondria have shrunk and atrophied and died off? So those two things are fundamentally what are controlling energy levels. So that was a long answer to describe many years of you know, <laughs> my understanding of fatigue. Well, I've just felt like I was back in college biology, I guess. There, We got a pretty good course in it. Yeah. So so yeah, how do we then, so what's the antidote, right? I mean, as you're talking, I'm like, okay, what's the, uh, right, which is obviously probably what your whole life's work's been about, right? The, the energy blueprint, the new book. But what do we do to, you know, for us, especially Richard and I, and then all of our listeners, what do we, what are, yeah, yeah where do we go from here? Because I thoroughly over, overwhelmed by hearing all that. Oh which yeah, I'm glad. I'm exactly, glad. exactly. I'm, I'm, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm screwed. <laughs> I know, I'm like, right? okay, I've got four years left. I've got right. four good years left. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what I appreciate. <laughs> I mean, the, and, I, and then I, I'm out of energy. All my, right. I was like, do, can I take those in a, like some type of supplement or not supplement, <laughs> right. just like eat mitochondria. How do I, how do I? Yeah, because I, I appreciate the geekdom of it because that's what I, I'm glad there are geeks out there like you that, that embrace this stuff. <laughs> did you just right? call our guest a geek? I did. But oh I, my I say Lord. that with, I, I, I say it with love. Compliment. I say okay, it with good. love. Okay, I was going to say, he's I, been I, back one I day. Love, no. We'll bleep that out. No, I love geeks. I mean, I, I mean, we need people to geek out on these things, right? <laughs> yes, I agree. Right? I agree, because, 110%. Because that's what I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to piggyback off of what Matt's saying. Yeah. This question is like, oh my what God. What do we do with Ari, all that? please help me because you just overwhelmed me. Yeah, exactly. I'm hoping that the... the There's a punchline here. The blueprint here is going to save me or at least at least categorize this and help me find Get, out what 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 is causing me to be energy less. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's a super big question. <laughs> so I'm going to narrow it down for us. Perfect. You said one thing as you guys were talking there uh, that I've got four years left. Yes. And I think <laughs> what you mean by that is maybe you're 66 years old. No, <laughs> well, I'm not. How but close you are to 70. No, you yeah. just made me feel older thinking about all this mitochondrial energy. I was like, shoot, I can just feel it okay. leaving my body right now. I've got yeah. four years um, and then I'm screwed. Like, I feel like, like mine are all in defense <laughs> right, mode. Right, right yeah. exactly. It's like, oh my gosh, maybe they're all just turned on defense mode. It's like, I've got none left. It's like, I can barely get to the car. Somebody help yeah. me. So, <laughs> so how do we, okay, so how do we shift this madness? How do we make it work? All right. Well, let's, let's talk about this, this aspect first. Okay. So I, I talked about how the, how we lose our mitochondrial mm -hmm. capacity. We're losing, uh, about 10% of our mitochondrial capacity or our mitochondria, uh, with each decade of life, mm -hmm. ultimately losing from the time we're young adults to the time we're 70, losing about 75% of our mitochondria on average. Mm -hmm. Um, the cool part is it doesn't need to be that way. Mm -hmm. And 
um, just as th this, these processes are dynamic in our cells. So just as we can lose our mitochondria and just as a muscle can shrink and atrophy from being in a cast and, and not used for a couple months, you can exercise that muscle and you can grow it back. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same is true with your mitochondria. If you subject them to the right kinds of stimuli, you, uh, you can grow bigger, stronger mitochondria, and you can literally create more, more mitochondria from scratch, from mitochondrial biogenesis. So um, how do we do that? I think this is one of the most fundamental, important keys to enhancing our energy levels, whether we're talking about going from chronic fatigue back to normal, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that means, <laughs> right. or sort of better than normal, normal right? you know, a typical, relatively healthy person to supernatural, to, to superhuman levels of energy mm -hmm. and, and to be bursting with youthful levels of energy like we had when we were a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I think that should be the goal. Yes, and um, to, to, to do that, we need to build youthful levels of mitochondria at the cellular level. So how do we do that? Well, fundamentally, it revolves around something called hormetic stress. And this is basically certain types of transient metabolic stressors that challenge your mitochondria and in the process stimulate them to adapt to those challenges by growing bigger and stronger and also making other adaptations like building up the internal antioxidant defense system that uh, ultimately make your cells and your mitochondria more resilient and resistant to a broad range of other stressors, which actually not only, not only will increase your energy levels by building more mitochondria, but will also translate into increased lifespan, longevity, and the reduced risk of numerous different diseases. We know that mitochondrial dysfunction and loss of mitochondria is tied to basically everything from neurodegenerative disease to cancer to heart disease mm -hmm. to depression and anxiety and, and, and a long list of a million other diseases. So um, we do that by subjecting our body regularly to hormetic stress. And the main types of hormetic stressors are exercise, various subtypes of, of exercise. Um, so we can talk about resistance training or uh, endurance exercise or high intensity interval training, mm -hmm. sprint interval training. Um, we can engage in breath holding practices, one of my favorite types of hormetic stress that has a huge impact for people with chronic fatigue. Um, we can um, engage in heat exposure, like using a sauna, amazing research around that. Um, we can engage in cold, uh, cold hormetic stress, um, cold showers, cold baths, things like that. Um, we can engage in um, uh, different you, you, uh, fasting and intermittent nutrient cycling. We can engage in the use of different kinds of phytochemicals that are sometimes called exercise mimetics because they stimulate a lot of these same hormetic pathways that stimulate our mitochondria to grow bigger and stronger. Um, and we can also use supplements to, to help stimulate that as well. So um, there's many different ways that we can do this, but ideally we wanna layer in at least a few different types of these hormetic stressors into our life to be regularly challenging our mitochondria and stimulating them to grow and stimulating mitochondrial biogenesis so we can create more mitochondria and get back to youthful levels of mitochondria. Love it. So I'll do the exercise and the breath work. You do the cold showers and the cold baths. <laughs> yeah. We'll split this up. We'll make this we'll work do. for us. Sounds good. <laughs> Well, is that, and I've heard a lot of that, but uh, before in different, different ways, I was wondering if you were going to talk about intermittent fasting or what I've heard as called intermittent fasting, um, because I've heard that does lead to mitochondrial regeneration. Is that, is that accurate based on your research or knowledge? So, um, fasting is very useful for something called mitophagy, autophagy okay. and mitophagy. Um, which is a process of basic where, where our cells basically break down uh, worn out, broken, mm -hmm. dysfunctional cell parts mm -hmm. and 
at the mitochondrial level, worn out dysfunctional mitochondria mm -hmm. and rebuilds new healthy ones. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a process that should be happening every night, especially while mm -hmm. we sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, it's generally speaking impaired for reasons relating to circadian rhythm and sleep, which I talked a bit about before. Um, and so we wanna enhance that as much as possible that way by optimizing our circadian rhythm and sleep. But fasting is also incredibly useful for basically amplifying, massively amplifying those uh, cellular breakdown and rebuilding processes to clean up a lot of the damaged parts um, and, and rebuild new healthy ones. So mm -hmm. very useful for that. It's prob you're probably not gonna get a lot of mitochondrial biogenesis mm -hmm. from engaging in fasting, meaning the, the creation of more mitochondria, right. but you will do a lot of mitochondrial cleanup. Mm. Okay. Is, is the, is the kind of discovery that the importance of mitochondria and, and all this fatigue, is that something that we all share no matter what's causing it? For example, I know I just found out a few weeks ago that my testosterone level is pretty low, and I know that is probably contrib contributing to some of my tiredness, right? Is that low testosterone putting my mitochondria in a defensive posture? And do you see what I'm saying? It's like, is, is, is that the constant, like, no matter what is causing? Is that the symptom of the mitochondria not, yeah. not, not, not like being if, healthy? Like if my testosterone level was increased, and I'm sure there's all kinds of different ways to increase that, even with that, even some of the things you're seeing here, right? I mean, if you, if hormetic stress, I'm going to probably raise my testosterone level some level. But is raising the testosterone level, is that going to cause the mitochondria to get out of defense mode and, and get into cell creation or, or producing it's the reverse. ATP or is it the other way around? Yeah, well, isn't it the reverse of the if the mitochondria is stressed out, it's not going to produce, you're not going to produce yeah. as much testosterone because you said it was the upstream ending, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's more the latter. There is, there's always somewhat of a bi-directional input. Um, but in general, I would see the low testosterone as a symptom, symptom. of the, 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 sort of poor mitochondrial function. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we know testosterone levels in men are much lower now than they were a few, just a few decades ago. Um, I forget the exact, exact statistics, but on average, it's like men have something like uh, 30 to 40% lower testosterone levels than men of equivalent age did 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, stress, poor sleep, circadian rhythm disruption, poor nutrition, um, environmental toxicant exposure. Uh, and all of those will contribute to poor mitochondrial function. Hormone synthesis literally depends upon mitochondrial function. So we have uh, Leydig cells in our, in, our, in our testicles and um, those Leydig cells are heavily impacted by the mitochondrial function in those cells and their ability to synthesize testosterone depends upon adequate cellular energy production from those mitochondria. So by, by um, ba basically another way, more broad way to think about this is virtually all of the energy produced by virtually all of the trillions of cells in your body from your brain to your heart to your liver, to your muscles, uh, to your immune cells, to your um, hormone producing glands and Leydig cells in your testicles depends upon the energy produced by mitochondria. Mm. And uh, if your mitochondria are not producing energy adequately, those cells that those mitochondria are in and the tissues and the organs that, they're, that they compose um, will not function as well as a result of being in an energy deficit. So that's sort of the big picture of, this is why mitochondria can be so upstream right. of everything is because ultimately everything in your body is dependent on, um, on the energy being produced by mitochondria. So if you optimize, if you pull that lever, uh, 
um, you can optimize almost everything in the body as a result of that, including things like testosterone production. Yeah. So mm -hmm. no matter what is the symptom, you know, and, the, and I guess that's what's kind of an aha for me is like no matter what. Okay. Yeah, it can overwhelm anything. What's causing my, mm -hmm. you know, fatigue. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, I can't go wrong if I focus at least as a starting point to try to increase my, you know, or to try to help my mitochondria, right? No matter what we're, mm -hmm. if that's what I'm hearing from you, right? I mean, if I start there, it's, it's, I can't lose. It's a starting point, right? Yes. I mean, I can only be doing good things. And the, yep. yeah, as opposed it's, to going, hey, great... go ahead. Yeah, sorry, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, instead of me going to the, you know, I just thinking about, things that happened with me and my wife like my wife's like oh it's why am i so tired it's like she goes to the doc well it's your thyroid right and so they're treating the i gotta get my thyroid level it's a it's like a constant thing and there's no talk or discussion of what we talked about here like mm -hmm. how do you build your mitochondria and right. that seems to be that would be a better thing to do not not that she doesn't have mm -hmm. problems with her thyroid but what can go Let's try well, the, the, right. the real question that I would ask is why does she right. have problems with exactly. the thyroid? What, right. what, what, what has caused the thyroid gland to not be producing as much exactly. uh, thyroid hormone as it should be? And um, that could be non-autoimmune or it could be an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland. But all of that is very much related to mitochondrial function. Right. Um, we know, for example, that if, you know, one of my areas of expertise that I've written a book on is, is called uh, is red light therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, there are several studies where they've taken people with uh, hypothyroidism and they've given them a dozen or two dozen red light therapy sessions with the red light directed on their thyroid gland. And they've shown massive improvements in uh, thyroid hormone production and reductions in uh, TPO antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, which are driving the autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland. And to, to the extent, this is not a small effect, this is to the extent that people with um, years-long hypothyroidism, um, in some studies they've shown nearly half of those people were able to get off their thyroid hormone medication completely as a result of shining red light on their, on their uh, specific kinds of red light, not any kind. but. Um, shining red light on their thyroid gland. Um, why is that? Well, it turns out red, red light therapy and near-infrared light therapy work primarily on the mitochondria to help them produce energy more efficiently, help them grow bigger and stronger, also affecting gene expression uh, in those tissues. But um, largely what's going on is the result of how they're modifying mitochondrial function and basically helping those cells produce energy more effectively and helping the mitochondria become more resilient. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you get these massive improvements in, uh, in thyroid hormone levels. The same, uh, there's, there's also research, by the way, showing that shining it on your testicles will increase testosterone production. So that's one sort of lever that we can pull to optimize mitochondrial health. But we know also... Um, Richard's going to get a flashlight. I can see it right now. He's going to drive around with a flashlight in his truck. That's right. And yeah. Yeah. So when you say any... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to capture this for Richard. <laughs> the, yeah. um, not for me personally. Because I, uh, I... Yeah. yeah. You haven't been speaking to me at all, just Richard. The, um, <laughs> the, um, I, when you're saying hypothyroid, I'm sitting here going, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before, and I just don't want to take the medicine. So I appreciate that that's in this conversation. The When you say red light therapy, and I've heard this before, but I, I didn't, are there literally devices you can buy that are just specifically, what, you said it had to be a specific red light, not just any red light, right? So I can't just put a piece of construction paper over a flashlight, right? I mean, so you just buy this stuff on Amazon or you where, I mean, where do you get stuff like that? I wouldn't recommend buying it on Amazon. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, that's why I there are the several companies that that sell high quality lights, mm -hmm. red and near infrared light therapy lights. Mm -hmm. um, they're yep. LED panels, and um, there's a number. There's like another twenty companies that have emerged uh, largely as a result of the the book mm -hmm. that I wrote on the topic a mm -hmm. few years ago, uh, which is sort of like it's become the book mm -hmm. on that topic, and. Um, uh, 
the best resource for which mm -hmm. lights to buy would be to either grab my book on Amazon or if, you know, just so people know I'm not trying to mm -hmm. make money off this recommendation, um, go on my website and mm -hmm. I have a, 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 a very abbreviated version of my book on my website on the mm -hmm. energyblueprint.com. It's called The mm -hmm. Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy. Oh, okay. So if you Google, you know, mm -hmm. Ultimate Guide Red Light Therapy Energy it'll Blueprint, uh, it'll come up. Yep. And... Um, if you go there, there's a super short, you know, 20 page version of the, the 200 page book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I have the light recommendations oh, listed there and also some discount codes, but yeah, oh, nice. there's, there are lights on Amazon, but it's really important to get a high quality, high power device. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of just junk, junk stuff on Amazon that people have just thrown up there sourced from from right. China and from Alibaba, right. and they're just throwing up on Amazon in their, their garbage yep. lights. Okay, and nice. thank you for clarifying that, because I yeah, obviously yeah. That, that that's one of those. It, it seems like that's a uh, easy, simple start for that. I mean, like you said, you just shine a red light on your thyroid and twelve. I mean, it, how long? I mean, is it ten minutes, fifteen, whatever it is? It doesn't really matter. You're just shining a light there, right? You could be laying in bed reading a book if the right. I mean, it, exactly right. I mean, yep. So that's a s simple, I can see Richard right now. I mean, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sit, sitting on the red light. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. isn't there a song, turn on the red light? <laughs> Rocks and yeah, no, Roxanne okay, never mind. Let's go on with the show. Yeah. The, the eat for energy book. Does yeah. it, is that, are we talking, what can I expect from that? I mean, are we talking about foods that are going to help? Because this is the brand new book that's right, just coming brand out. Book that's coming out in May. Is this, or when we talk about eat for energy, does, are we talking about mitochondria, you know, helping our mitochondria that way as well? Do you talk about that in your new book? Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge focus of the book. So the book is basically the distillation of everything I know about nutrition to optimize mitochondrial health. Okay. And we do that by, um, there's, there's five chapters in the book. Okay, and chapter one is basically talking about using nutrition to optimize circadian rhythm and how you synchronize this central clock, central circadian clock mm -hmm. in the brain to the peripheral clocks throughout your body. Um, chapter two is talking all about body composition and body composition is basically how much fat do you have, how much muscle mm -hmm. do you have? And if you've got excess body fat or if you've got too little muscle mass, those are, those are very big causes, drivers of fatigue and mitochondrial dysfunction. So how do we use nutrition to optimize those two variables? Um, blood sugar dysregulation, um, hypoglycemia, mm -hmm. about one third of adults have hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, two to five hours after eating meals, huge cause and contributor of, uh, of, of poor energy levels. Um, uh, glycemic variability, fluctuating from high blood sugar to low blood sugar is another big driver. And uh, we also know 80% of adults in the US, uh, even if they're not diabetic or pre-diabetic, experience spikes of blood sugar throughout the day, almost every day, mm -hmm. in the pre-diabetic or diabetic ranges. And hyperglycemia is also a cause of inflammation and oxidative stress that is basically damaging and shutting down mitochondria. It's another one of these signals that to mitochondria that mitochondria basically say, we're under attack, we need to go into defense mode and turn down energy production. So um, all of those blood sugar variables are a huge aspect of, you gotta, you gotta fix your blood sugar regulation if you want good energy levels. So that's uh, chapter three. And uh, then there's a chapter on gut health and there's a chapter on brain health. And both of those are also big levers to move um, for how to optimize your energy levels. Um, after that, there's a chapter on superfoods for energy. And there's another chapter, almost an encyclopedia of, and this is, this chapter alone is worth the price of admission, worth the price of the book by itself. It's a chapter on supplements, top the top evidence-based supplements for energy enhancement and mitochondrial enhancement. And this is, you know, if you look energy and like supplements for energy up online, you're gonna get a junk list of like caffeine and stimulants mm -hmm. based stuff. Um, what I have is like the real science of how to actually optimize your energy levels. Cause caffeine and stimulants don't, they give you a temporary boost for a couple hours and, uh, and then you go back, but mm -hmm. 
But much worse than that, if you use them every day, they actually sabotage your energy levels over time. They actually make your energy levels, your baseline energy levels worse. Mm -hmm. So um, caffeine and stimulants is not a good way to try to optimize your energy levels. It's really counterproductive. So we need to use other, other methods to do that. So the, the last thing I'll say, um, uh, just giving an overview of the book is this is not some kind of extreme wacky diet. You know, a lot of diet book authors are trying to make a claim like, um, you know, everybody else has got it wrong. It's not low fat. It's not uh, veganism. Mm -hmm. It's not l low carb. It's not keto. It's not Mediterranean. It's not paleo. Really, the one true best human diet is this. And they sell you on some wacky stuff like trying to convince you that uh, tomatoes and beans and lentils are the big cause of disease or plant foods are trying to kill you and you should eat nothing but meat and like <laughs> right. all kinds of nonsense like this that misrepresents the scientific literature. Uh, and um, there's huge financial incentives for people to engage in that kind of thing because if they can create the next diet that mm -hmm. sort of goes viral as the next big thing, you can make you know millions, tens of millions of dollars on that if you become the next keto or you know the, right. the next paleo um and uh what i'm doing in this book is not that i'm not prescribing one specific diet i'm actually just giving you a collection of um nutrition strategies and hacks and superfoods and supplements that you can add to your diet that can integrate flexibly uh, with any particular dietary pattern that, that you may have, that you may like, everything from veganism to, to keto and everything between. Um, and you can implement as much or as little as you, as you like. You know, I recommend you just take one or two strategies, do them for a week, then you know, integrate those, then, then add another one or two strategies. But uh, I just want to make the point this is not like you, you don't have to completely overhaul your life and adopt some new crazy wacky extreme diet to to follow my recommendations. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I was going to ask that. It's so it's not so much a meal plan book or or necessarily a diet, but it's just stuff to, like you said, hacks that I can incorporate into whatever I'm doing in my life right now. The goal mm -hmm. is to just That's get, right. to take care of my little mitochondria. <laughs> Your little mitochondria. Well, well they shine a little. red light on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, shine a light on the little, little mitochondria. I That's what makes them better. I like it. I, I see a t shirt in the future. Yeah, shine a light on my mitochondria. Shine a light on your mitochondria. I love that, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited cool. to see that because yeah, I am too. I mean, if, if there's one word or one thing that I never thought would enter my vocabulary and my mindset is mitochondria. I think right. the last time I said that word was 1986 but, <laughs> <laughs> but i'm very intrigued by yeah, this yeah, yeah. because this this i mean it makes sense particularly if it's an upstream thing mm -hmm. i mean why not start there right right and um yeah that's great when does the book come out i mean so in may in, in may i mean what's the actual release date i want to make sure that people know may 10th mm -hmm. is there a website where people can go to to pre-order the book to look at the book or you know where do people go? Yeah, for um, I, you can get it really anywhere. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever you want to buy books online. Um, and the one thing I will say is uh, we're, we're having a, a pre-order bonus. Mm -hmm. So if you after you purchase, if you want to email me the receipt at ari at the uh, I will hook you up with $300 worth of free courses as wow. a thank oh, you for pre-ordering. So it's Ari. And helping me hopefully get some on some bestseller lists, Wall Street Journal or Love maybe it. New York Times. A R I at the energy blueprint.com. Correct? Yep. Okay. So if they email you, then you will send them $300. Is that what I heard? <laughs> no. $300, $300 worth of courses. courses. <laughs> All right. Sure. He's like, no, 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 no. We're not putting the, that out there. Is the whole, I know we're getting short on time yeah, yeah, but we, the whole energy blueprint system, does it talk about what everything in your three books, the forever fat loss, which came out in 2015, the, mm -hmm. the red light therapy in 2018 and the eat for energy. Is that all incorporated in the energy blueprint system? Yes. All of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The energy blueprint course is a, it's a $500 course and it's comprehensive, complete guide to nutrition and, and everything you need to know about lifestyle and supplementation and light therapies and everything. Oh, nice. I mean, it's, 
it's everything to the point that some people are overwhelmed by it. So, <laughs> right. um, yeah, that's why we need you at the center of it, right? To make yeah. it to make it simple. But it, so, who's the who are we ideal looking for? I guess I was going to ask at the beginning is like, how do I know if I'm just fatigued versus chronically fatigued? As an airline pilot, we're always talk, dealing with fatigue and back of the clock stuff and circadian rhythm and all that stuff. So I'm very familiar with all this stuff, but how do I know if I'm chronically fatigued as opposed to just dog ass tired? It's just semantics. So, um, even, so there, there's one thing, which is MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, where you can say, I have chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome is basically a collection of symptoms. If you have a certain set of symptoms and you have it for a long enough period of time, and the one sort of key differentiating factor that, um, is important there is uh, something called post-exertional malaise. If you have uh, severe debilitating fatigue where like you can't get out of bed and you just feel awful for two or three days after doing a, a physical exertion, after doing a workout, um, and you have these symptoms for longer than six months, you can say, well, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. It's at a mm. severe enough level. Gotcha. You have this post-exertional malaise and you've had it for six months, so you, you have CFS. Um, outside of that, f energy levels are basically a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you have youthful high energy levels, and on the other end of the spectrum, you've got low energy levels. And so the question is not what label you can slap on it and yeah. what words we use to to describe it it's um do you have the levels of energy that you had when you were a kid or do you have much less less energy than you had would you like more energy yeah. those are the yep. real questions that are that are meaningful i say yes yes i agree too 110 percent. i mean as i've gotten i noticed it in my 30s and it just seems to have it kind of ebbs and flows so i've got i've got to get this dialed in i had me and my wife too i mean we're both yep. in our 50 early 50s and we're just like god we're just so tired all the time right mm -hmm. and um time to get your shit together time to get it together sorry you need a red light and <laughs> hold my breath and get exposed to heat and i love it all i love it all we need i'm it. excited for this do you book. ever do you, yeah i am too do you ever do like live retreats like where you do week long two week long like reset stuff or or have you done that or would you think I, about I that? haven't uh, I haven't yet I've, okay. I've considered it um, I'm living in Costa Rica now and I'm living oh, in a nice. place where there's lots of retreat centers yeah, yeah of course um, so yeah. it's it's definitely a possibility yeah it'd I be very do cool that but yeah. nothing in the in the works at the moment I think you've got number one and number two people ready to sign up so you, you put it out there in Costa Rica, why awesome. not, right? Going I went ziplining there. It was amazing. Sign and up for the energy blueprint. Exactly. And and hopefully, we'd love to have you come on after the book. Uh, we've got a Global Happiness Summit coming up in July, and I'd love to have you come back on there and speak if you'd like to and kind of enlighten us more because, uh, you know, obviously there's a whole, you spent your whole life studying this, as Richard alluded to earlier. And so I think the more we bring awareness, just even today with this mitochondria yeah. and everything, I mean, just, it's, it, it just, for people who have never studied this, I think it just gets us thinking about it, right? And starts heading it down that direction. It's not, to your point, it's not about some crazy fad thing. You have to go do it all oh. at once. It's just start integrating some of this into your life, see the results, and then you want to integrate more as you get more energy, I would, I would think, right? Well, yeah. like I said, like, as I said before, and I say with love, I do mm -hmm. appreciate the yeah. geekdom of it because yeah. I, I couldn't geek out on this, and I'm glad that I got someone like you to do it Definitely. and to, to make it simple for Definitely. me to understand. Uh, we're coming up on an hour, yeah, and yeah. I'm sure we could talk. Yeah. Did, did you yeah. get to ask him yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 to? Yeah, like I said, we didn't get everything in, so I think he's got to come back and see us more. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so much yes, thank you. Uh, wisdom, and I know I'm a better person for sitting yeah, an hour with you. Um, how can people reach out to you? We talked a little bit about your website and the book and everything else, but how, how do you want people to reach out to you and, and learn more about you? Um, right now, just grab the book. Okay. And, you know, everything, if you want to follow my, my work more broadly, you know, you could go to my website or follow mm -hmm. my podcast and mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But the biggest thing right now is just go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and, mm -hmm. and grab a copy of Eat for Energy and, uh, and enjoy it and implement it and enjoy the, the improvements in your energy levels and in your life. Perfect. Sounds good. We'll have links to all that in the show notes. Ari, thanks for Thank coming you. on the show. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. It was a joy chatting with you, and uh, that was a really well-conducted interview, and uh, I hope to do it again. Yes, Thanks. sir. Thank you for being a part of the Bright Vibe podcast. For more information, go to brightvibe.com. That's B-R-I-T-E, vibe, V-I-B-E.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>